Thank you, Chantal. It's good to see you. It's good to see all of you. I lost my internet connection for a couple of minutes, so I was panicking, but I'm back. <laughs> I hope that doesn't happen again. And there's a Baustelle, someone's building something in my house, so it's all messy. But it's very good to see you. And um, I'm very happy to have been asked to hold this uh, introductory keynote uh, to this webinar, Visions for Children's Books, Volume 2. So the title of my keynote is Bridging the Diversity Gap in Children's Literature. And I'm going to move on. How do I do this? I have to scroll down. Oops. Okay. That's the content of my lecture. So um, I'm going to begin by talking about lack of diversity in children's literature. And uh, then my second step is going to be uh, to talk about cultural violence and the pervasiveness of dehumanization in children's literary, literary lives. And I'd like to show some examples. I don't want to reproduce all the extremely dehumanizing con co um, content, but I do want to show um, what quality of dehumanization are we talking about. So I'll just show enough to get the quality and then we'll move on. And finally, I want to speak about uh, what does it mean to try and diversify everything at the same time. This is more of an intersectional dilemma. And um, this is where the bridges come in. And I'm going to suggest um, a model for dealing with um, the, the enormous task of trying to diversify everything at the same time. And this is the point that you're going to understand at the end of my lecture. So if for the third point, we are around 30% together, we're good. Okay, so I want to begin by reminding us of the consistent lack of diversity in kids' literature. I'm going to shorten children's literature to kids' lit. And in young adults, that's the, the, the um, Y and the A in young adult uh, literature. But I will focus more on kids' literature. That is my first point. And then I will proceed to speak about the stigmatizing, even dehumanizing realities with which a hyper-diverse, a very plural post-migrant generation of children is confronted with when they begin to explore literally, literary wor worlds. This is my second point. And then I will move on to a set of strategies of recognition, strategies of inclusion, and strategies of destigmatization through literature, through children's literature. And I will conclude that point with an argument for a more decisive focus on book collections rather than on one single book as a strategy for diversification. That will at the same time be my concluding point. So let's move on to the first point I want to make. Diversity gap studies, lack of diversity, missing in literature, gained popularity within the context of kids lit in the North American context around the mid 1990s. And I'd like to show you very briefly three infographics. Uh, these are all from the CCBC, the Center for Children's Books um, at the School of Edu for Education in Wisconsin. Um, that's all in my uh, sources. So you can go to the blog and, and uh, uh, take a look at the infographics again. So this is the first info infographic on the right. I, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very disoriented with right and left. Driving school was quite difficult for me, so my driver, uh, driving teacher was always saying to me, to me, or to you, <laughs> to avoid saying right or left. Anyway, so this is a fast infographic, and um, it's, um, what it tries to show is a long longitudinal study. It's a quantitative study, and um, at this point in 2012, it said 18 years um, of um, data, and um, I'm going to show you in the next slide, I'm thinking that we see, um, how, what data they're collecting. Where am I showing you this? Oh, a couple of slides still coming, some patients. So the second infographic is one that's been, that was illustrated. Yes, Mina, you're probably, uh, this is your world, the illustration world. <laughs> um, the infographic was illustrated by um, a children's books uh, illustrator, Tina Kugler. And what we see here in 2012 is the disproportionate representation. We see the overproportional representation of uh, white kids, that's 93%. And then we see the representation of 
kids of African heritage um, in the North American context, usually as African American kids. Then we see Latin X kids, 1.5%. Then we see First Nations, um, Indigenous Native Americans, um, 1%. And then we see Asian Pacific um, Americans who are 2%. So that's 2012. And the most recent one, and it's going to be exciting to see where we have, uh, where our material overlaps, because I was looking at, at DAPO's material, it's also material I've been dealing with for years. I'm pretty sure there's going to be some overlap at some point. That's always an exciting thing. So that's the last infographic. Um, and since I'm sharing my screen, <laughs> all kinds of indiscretions are going to happen here, but okay. So um, this is the last um, infographic and it's the most recent one. This is the um, statistics for 2018. We do see some slight changes. Uh, the changes are due to two things. One, they're due to the um, campaign, hashtag we need diverse books and several other campaigns that have um, included publishing houses like Lee and Low Publishers, the CCBC, um, authors, um, different prizes, uh, the Martin Luther King uh, um, a book prize and so on. Um, that's, that's one reason there's been more diversification because there's movement, there's social movements pushing for diversification, but there's also diversification because there's been a disaggregation of the categories that are counted. So fictional uh, uh, characters and animal characters were separated. That's the category animal and other. And uh, that's one of the disturbing um, findings that animal and other is still represented approximately three times more than the first racially dehumanized group. So for some reason, it's easier to, to, to um, actually depict fictive characters and animals. The, the animals obviously have no invest in investment in what we do with them, so they're out of this equation. But it's easier to depict animals and fictional creatures than to depict racially uh, marginalized um, collectives and children. So that's the last infographic. And now I'll explain what they count. So what they count, um, these diversity gap studies, which focus on racism and racial marginalization. And we will move on to look at other forms of dehumanization and marginalization. And I'm going to say that the studies usually do not really have a very intersectional perspective. They tend to go in with one dimension of dehumanization. And that's also the, 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 the huge task of um, doing uh, diversification work to be able to, to actually try and, 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 um, and, and, and have some measure of justice in, in how we bring in different underrepresented groups. So my own focus um, actually to, uh, 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 looks into underrepresented groups, which sounds very boring, but uh, that's, that's just the, the footnote so you understand how the next studies I'm going to reference uh, feature into that. So right now I'm, I'm talking about dehumanization in the context of racism and being marked uh, and marginalized within the context of racism. So these diversity gap studies, the studies which um, are focus on racism and racial marginalization, in effect use the method of descriptive statistics, quantitative. They count authorship by racialized categorization. That's books by authors who are uh, BPOC, so Black, Indigenous, Yasmina had, uh, had already spoken about, about it, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And um, then they also count what they call multicultural content. I'm very uncomfortable with the word multicultural, but I cited it. And what they mean is books about, um, again, Black, Indigenous, and people of color characters. So um, that's what they're counting. And I'm going to refer you to the CCBC blog to um, um, look at the disaggregation of this data again. So I'm going to close um, the, that first um, um, a step by saying that one of the most perplexing findings is that it seems to be easier to portray animals and imaginary beings at three or 20 times more than racially marginalized characters and their families. And I've just made a slight mistake. My first step ends with the next uh, a couple of, of slides because I'm showing you two more studies. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next study. And um, I would like to illustrate this strange dynamic by citing one more North American study before I move on to our context in Europe. 
This one focuses on patterns of female underrepresentation and the underlying gendered messages. The study, Gender in 20th Century Children's Books, Patterns of Disparity in Titles and Central Characters, was carried out at the Florida State University. The most comprehensive study of 20th century children's books ever undertaken in the United States has found a bias towards tales that feature men and boys as lead characters. Surprisingly, researchers found that even when the characters are animals, they tend to be male. Next slide. The data used in this study was collected from three sources, and these sources are considered central for how the, the book market in children's literature and child adults literature works. So in drama with college toyahum, it's kind of like how the, the, the market is controlled or, or regulated. I think regu regulated is the word. The data used in the study was collected from three sources, which are considered to be central for molding the kids lit market in the North American context. These are the Caldecott Medal, which recognizes distinguished picture books of the preceding year, the Little Golden Book series, and the children's books book catalog. So the Caldecott Medal is equivalent to maybe the Deutsche Jugendliteratur Prize, to the, to the prizes that we have for literature. The Little Golden Books are books uh, in Germany, uh, that would be the Konibücher. So it's, 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 it's a book that's relatively um, a, 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 of a low price and sometimes also a book that you would find at, at um, huge hypermarkets um, um, when you're exiting them. So it's a book that's, that you fall into all the time. That's why they're so important for the book market because they're very, very easily accessible. And finally, the children's books catalog is um, a catalog that libraries use. Children's libraries use this, this catalog. Um, it's compiled every year with all the new uh, public publications and, and therefore it's very influential. And in German, uh, Germany, we also have this books catalog. It's um, in Reutlingen, it's called the EKZ. It's a, it's a um, shopping, uh, um, children's library shopping um, instrument. So the findings, let me come to the findings and then um, I'll move on to the next, um, the next slide. Some of the findings were that males, human males, are, are, are central characters in 57% of the children's books published per year, while only 31% are female human central characters. And male animals are central characters in more than 23% of the books per year, while female animals are only 7.5% of central characters. Only one Caldecott winner featured a female animal as a main character without any male central characters. And I'm aware this is very binary. So I've, I've, I tried to, to do something about breaking the binary and in my presentation, I do have to tell you it wasn't very successful. This is also one of the dilemmata and trilemmata of not working. Uh, in the context of oppression systems. I'll come to that later. So this one book is called, it's a 1985 book, it's called Have You Seen My Duckling? And it follows Mother Duck asking other pond animals this very question as she searches for a missing duckling. The male central characters vary from Peter Rabbit, who's a rabbit, I thought it was a rodent, but apparently rabbits are not rodents, and Curious George, who is a monkey. So I'm going to move on to the last um, study that I, I want to cite um, from the French German speaking context. It's actually France and, and uh, Austria, but I wrote French and German speaking context. So the last study I want to cite is a French German dissertation which focuses on heteronormative patterns of representation and the marginalization of queer desiring youth. The title of this dissertation is, and I'm going to loosely translate because my French is awful. I can just order something to eat in French, but aside from that, I can't really do much. So, Sissy Boys and Tom Girls, Representations of uh, Homosexuality in the, the, the novels, in French novels for the youth, something like that. Young adult literature in France, and then Sissy Boys and Tom Girls represented in those. So, uh, Renaud La Gabrielle analyzes 30 French young adult and children's books published between 1989 and 2003, which all thematize queer desire. The first queer protagonist who is female is registered in 1989. This is the author Kathy Bernheim's novel Cote d'Azur. And uh, this novel was translated under the same title by Belz and Gelberg. The, the French uh, uh, publisher is Guillemar. I'm going to try and do that. 
So some of his findings are that female queer desire is rendered next to invisible. In his whole sample, he finds only eight novels with lesbian characters. The authorship of queer desire in young adult lit successively becomes subject matter for non-queer authors. And this is interesting for diversity when people begin to write about um, experiences that for them are not lived experiences. Um, it's a very dilemmatic. It, it's, on, on one level, it's good because now there's more people writing about the content. But on the other level, we're going to look at some examples that show that it's very problematic. So um, the authorship of Queer Desire successfully becomes subject matter for non-queer authors. Uh, Brigitte Smadja, who wrote the Maxine series in drama Max und die Frauen, Max and the Women, or Marie Aud Mouret, who wrote Oh Boy in German, Die für immer, which is one of my pet peeves. I think German uh, translations are usually so awful and I have no idea why Oh Boy has to be translated, but okay, whatever. And finally, um, the point that uh, Ren 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 Renaud uh, La Gabrielle ma makes is that publishers play a crucial role in supporting or in sabotaging recognition, equality, in rep equality and equity in recognition of the diversity of desire and uh, equal representation. He gives a ne negative example here of the author, um, and, and the author is not negative, the publisher is negative, Isabel Chailou, whose young adult book, HS, was supposed to end with a queer female protagonist's show of affection. In the original, the last sentence reads, and I pressed my lips onto hers. This very last sentence of the book had to be changed due to pressure exercised by the female publisher. And the final sentence was changed to, and I took her hand in my hand. And this concludes my first point. So I'm going to move on to my second point. And my second point is actually the most important thing I, I want to say today. So if there's any slide that's important, it's this one. Uh, you're going to want to go back and reference it. Um, the PowerPoint is probably going to be on some form of platform, I guess. So my second point is to speak very briefly about the stigmatizing, even dehumanizing realities with which a hyper-diverse, very plural, uh, plural post-migrant generation of children are confronted with when they begin to explore books. I would like to make three arguments here before I go on to show some of the material I have analyzed. So my first argument is I use the frame cultural violence, which is a blend of two faces of oppression to characterize the marginalizing or dehumanizing portrayals of BIPOC, uh, Black POC in kids' literature. I'm referencing Iris Marion Young, who's a political scientist, was, she died very young, 50 or something. So Iris Marion Young defines um, five faces of oppression in her analysis of justice and the politics of difference. And that's the same, it's a chapter of, of this book, Justice and the Polit of Politics of Difference. So these five faces of oppression are exploitation, marginalization, powerlessness, cultural imperialism and violence. And I have just put blended together cultural imperialism and violence to form cultural violence because I think it's such a, an intense lens to um, use to analyze kids' literature because kids' literature is intensely dehumanizing in very many cases. So I think if something is intensely dehumanizing, it needs an intense lens. So that's the first argument I want to make. The second argument that I want to make, I used to speak of underrepresentation and misrepresentation. And I don't speak of misrepresentation mis 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 anymore. It doesn't mean I never say misrepresentation. Um, if I'm citing Lauren Hill, obviously it makes sense to speak about misrepresentation, but I, it, you needed a more intense word. So I'm beginning to speak when I'm referring to stereotyping, overlooking, instrumentalizing, etc., of especially black POC and indigenous uh, uh, folks, I'm beginning to speak of a toxic representation. And the third argument I want to make is that these dehumanizing depictions are harmful fictions. They're fictional, but they're harmful. They schaden. They cause harm. There's a, an article in my sources called Read Between the Racism. So children and, and youth are being advised to read between the racism. And because um, I, I, I want to have an intersectional perspective. It's actually read between the harm. So um, the third argument is that this, these dehumanizing depictions are harmful fictions. They're not isolated. They're not coincidental. They're part of a set of techniques deployed to place marginalized groups, even in their own imaginations at the periphery. It is 
possible to starkly overrepresent male coded animals and male coded imaginary characters from sparkly vampires to preteen wizards to dragons to hobbits to muggles, muggles to orcs to dwarfs to elves to cyclops to snuffapogaluses or I don't know what the, the plural of snuffapogalus is then it's hardly too much to ask that underrepresented groups be included in the secondary world models of Kidlit. And the secondary world models, Sekundere Wirklichkeitsmodelle, is a reference to Decke Conil. I forgot to put her in there. She's in the sources. So having said that, let us look at some probably quite familiar examples for the normalization of social hierarchies and uh, of the exploitation of, of uh, BIPOC, of Black, Indigenous, and POCs and their resources, coupled with dehumanizing depictions of BIPOC in kids' literature. So anyone who knows me knows I'm going to start with Pippi Langstrumpf, which is highly ambivalent because Pippi Langstrumpf is like one of the most the, like prominent, very early depictions of punk culture. And, and punk culture is like, especially in, in children's and, and youth world, re, a good resource for obviously anarchy and, and uh, for independence and all these themes. So it just pains me that, all, that it just has to be this figure, but okay, I'm, not going, I'm going to stop my rant there. So uh, punk culture is a positive thing. And the rest of it is, the summary would be in a nutshell, living alone, motherlessness, the mother is an angel in heaven, colonial father, imperial ruler of an island that he stumbled upon, clueless psychics, subservient folks of color who believe in their own inferiority. And then it's considered iconic for a white-centric, West-centric feminist culture. I'm not saying that there's no folks of color who uh, um, are all fans of Pippi Longstocking, uh, Pippi Langstrom, but I'm saying that we are, we are that because literature has, has, is, is white-centric and West-centric. And, and being uh, um, socialized as a feminist, I was socialized as a feminist in the north of Germany on the border to Denmark, in Kiel, and this is what I was socialized with. So I was also um, into Pippi Langstrom for quite a while until I discovered the rest of Pippi Langstrom. We're going to move on to maybe a less um, familiar for some of you who are in childhood studies, you're going to know this. For the rest who are not in childhood studies, I'm, I'm not sure how, how much, how, how um, conversant this is going to be. So König Marcius um, is by Janusz Kozak, um, who is considered to be one of the founding voices for children's rights. The context is Eastern Europe, Poland. So um, it's a fictional account. In German, it's translated into König Marcius, or one of the German words I can hardly pronounce, all of my school education was in Nairobi, so I, I did my, my abitur in Nairobi, so I'm not a fast speaker. <laughs> and this is where this breaks me. It's this thing with saying Heinzchen. I always want to say Heinzchen. <laughs> so it's translated into, into König Heinzchen, one, and then König Heinzchen on the, on the lonely island. So this lonely island thing is always like a really bad idea. It it's opens the whole coloniality <laughs> of um, expedition theme. Which, which is in full force in this um, one um, children's book in a sequel. It's, it's one book in a sequel. So this, uh, a, a summary in a nutshell, motherlessness, fatherlessness, it's a child king, the intense power struggles and intrigues. There's, a, there's unclarified unending expeditions to countries marked as non-European. There's the magical end trope. I was trying to do this without reproducing it. So the magical, the figure of the magical person of color who um, um, is invincible and, and most of what they do is for the benefit of white folks so they can feel better about themselves. Um, there's extreme brutality mostly projected onto the other spectrum of those who are non-magical and, and uh, dehumanized folks of color. Um, and these folks believe, all of them, the ones who are magical and the ones who are not magical, they all believe in the natural superi superiority of the colonizers. And this one um, um, book is considered iconic for white West-centric children's rights. It's considered the founding text, more or less, for children's rights. I'm going to move on. So I didn't translate this into English. Um, 
how nicely white am I? It, does, it doesn't convey, doesn't convey the bitterness, the, the whole layers of bitterness that are inside this. So how nicely white I am. And it's a gruesome fest, more or less. This is uh, the winner of two prizes in 2006. It won the German Literature Prize in the category Jugendbuch, Youth uh, uh, Literature. And it also won the Peace Prize, the Gustav he he Heinemann Student Prize, also in 2006, which is, um, I, in the sources, I have one of the critiques about why this book, by two white German uh, um, uh, children's books authors who, who are completely disturbed, which I am also disturbed, about how this book could even win any of these prizes. So, and I'm going to give a content warning. Um, it's a white female child who is coming of age, 12 or 13, and she gets three birthday gifts on her birthday. This is all written in poetry. It's, like, it's coming from a, 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 um, a diary. Her diary is written in, in, in poetry. And the context is enslavement in Suriname. So Dutch, Dutch enslavement in Suriname. She gets three gifts. One gift is a handbag, one is a whip, and one is a little black child, so a human. And if you look at the, at the depiction on the cover of the page, it's this little girl on her birthday and her, pu uh, her pupilla, her pupil, is the little figure, the human. The, the name of this child is Coco. So that's the child that's in the pupil. So this is just to show you, this should be, uh, we should get, what's this uh, um, director of Get Out and Us to do a horror film about this, Jordan Peele? Jordan Peele needs to do a horror film about this because this is horror film material just waiting to be made into a horror film, basically. So um, the depictions of sexualized violence towards minors, and by minors, I'm, I'm not going to go into it. Uh, there's normalization of intense emotional and physical violence by the whole, by the entire family, uh, leaving scarring on a face of, of um, a young black girl because the mother of this child hit her with her high heel and slit her face open. So I'm um, sorry for reproducing that, but this is basically what, when, when I talk about cultural violence, I'm trying to make the point about this is what children are supposed to be reading. Um, yeah, okay, I'm going to move on. Uh, this is considered uh, somewhat iconic for white West-centric 1978 revolution leftist policies. That's where the, that's the author's background, uh, um, uh who wrote this book. So yeah, Dolph, Dolph Farouen. Okay, I'm going to come to something maybe fam familiar to those who are around my age group. I was born in 1973, so around people who were born in the 70s are probably going to know this. The younger folks, I don't know if you're even dealing with this anymore. You probably are not. This is Annie Blyton. Um, it's one of Annie Blyton's uh, um, um, productions. This one is called, it's a series of 21 novels, and it's called Famous Five in English. Uh, Fünf Freunde auf Deutsch. And uh, the central characters whom I, I want to feature on here are George and Joe, who are both female identifying, coded as girls. And uh, George is one of the famous five, one of, the, of, of this crew. And Joe is a child of Sinti or Roma heritage. And uh, uh, Joe is basically George's um, Spiegel, mirror. So there are actually some four mirrors. There's a queer text, non-binary, non-conforming uh, uh, text somewhere inside there. And Timmy the dog, who is George's dog, likes Joe very much as well. So it's kind of suggesting an underlying commonality. But at the same time, um, there's a continual pathologizing of Roma and Sinti families. There's a continual criminal criminalization of male identifying members of the Sinti and Roma community, especially targeting the father figures. There's something about uh, um, um, alcohol uh, uh, abuse, or something about criminalization, which is coded as smuggling. So there's also a class text somewhere in here. There's a celebration of the incarceration of most of the fathers when they're taken away to prison. That's usually a celebratory moment. And there's a justification of removing Roma and Sinti children from their communities and families towards the end of our Mission Civilatrice, which is this only, the only French I can speak, a civilizing mi mission into white middle classness. So there's a white savior complex somewhere in here, obsessed with what goes on inside the intimate walls of BIPOC family life. Joe is a recurring supporting character in the uh, uh, 21 Famous Five novels. And I have lifted uh, uh, um, something here out of a dialogue that I am giving a content warning for, which is um, after uh, um, uh, the children approaching each other on the beach and um, there was some wrestling involved in all of this, there's a scene where Joe, who is um, like this tomboyish character, we see her in the middle climbing 
scaling this wall. She can do everything. And then uh, Dick, who is a male identifying cis male and who is the least, I'm going to say the least butch of all the males, apparently is the character whom she's completely taken with. And then there's this uh, a figure at the end of the sentence where she says she doesn't like George, obviously doesn't like the girl, but she does like Dick. And she looked at him like, and then this cold consolation, I'm not going to, to, to speak about the enslavement and Prince, and she would do everything for him. So again, the intense cultural violence going on. Um, I have no idea how am I doing time-wise? I'm at the end, I'm almost at the end, but can I get a second? Uh, um, it's uh, 54, so six to let's say 10 minutes. Okay, good. If you make Thank it in you. six, it's great. Otherwise it's not, <laughs> not a okay, problem. Okay, let, let me try and talk faster. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. So <clears throat> I'm on to my last point. How do hyperdiverse children learn to read between the racism. Um, and I'm trying to, to talk about perspectives for dealing with the realities of cultural violence, with harmful fictions, and with toxic representations in uh, young adults and, and children's literature. Um, most of us, I assume, are familiar with um, the essay by Rudine Sims Bishop. We see her, Professor Rudine Sims Bishop, who's a professor for um, early childhood and also for information and library sciences uh, in, I, I think, uh, in Minnesota. Uh, which is um, a theme that's quite familiar right now. And she wrote this essay, Windows, Mirrors and Sliding Doors. And she writes, children need windows and mirrors. We need uh, the windows to be able to understand that within the same social situation, the child next to me is having a completely different, maybe very dehumanizing experience uh, that I am not having or seeing because I am white, middle-class, able-bodied, all of these things. And, um, we need mirrors to be able to see ourselves. This is, this is um, um, the, the, the perspective of missing in, in, in literature. Like um, I've, I've, uh, I have a text by Walter Dean Myers also in my sources that says, talks about the apartheid of children's literature and talks about where are all the BIPOC children in, in children's literature. And I've tried to show that there are many underrepresented groups. So um, there's a whole array of checklists. I put those in my sources because I, I, I sensed I wasn't going to have enough time to talk about them, uh, looking at the material that, that I had uh, um, taken on to, to look, look at together with you today. So it's all in my sources. I would like to end by linking the struggle to end the normalization of cultural violence in children's literature and to advance equity and equality in the representation of marginalized groups to the dilemma of the trilemma of inclusion. I'm going to refer you to the internet page of Maya Ann Boga, who's also a BPOC uh, um, inclusion pedagogue and inclusion researcher. And um, if you just type in trilemma of inclusion, you should actually come up to the page. She has texts in English and German. And uh, because her family, I think her mother is um, BIPOC French, I think there's also texts in French as well, if anyone wants to read something in French. So I'm only going to touch on this very shortly, looking at the time, but um, in, in the forum, in the group forum, or uh, in the discussion groups, if anyone wants to touch on this, we can actually, we can go back to this and revisit this. There's a multi-layeredness and complexity in trying to limit or end dehumanize, dehumanizing depictions and to advance equity in representation. At least three strategies of inclusion are necessary to do this work. I call them in, in my own work, demarginalization, destigmatization, and denaturalization. And my Anboga calls them normalization, empowerment, and deconstruction. So we have to normalize um, underrepresented and, uh, 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 um, and black POC kids in this sense. My Anboga discusses the complexity of applying empowerment and deconstruction and normalization strategies at the same time. And I'm referring you here to an older text by Axel Knapp, um, who also talks about um, the inner feminist um, struggles around trying to um, uh, do deconstruction work and empowerment work at the same time, all the, the while, while being uh, normalized and being um, in some form tolerated in the academy. I, I can't find another verb, another verb for that. In order to bring movement into the project of, of ending or limiting toxic representation, we need to deploy a set of strategies which cannot be covered in one single book. Um, um, but can be, uh, we can reach this, this uh, goal 
nearer by um, targeting book collections, which base their diversity family on a dilemmatic and trilemmatic approach. So I'm, I'm advocating an approach that doesn't want to get the perfect book or the perfect book collection. Nothing that's, that's very glossy and a quick fix. It's a very messy work in which we are also implicated. Like I said, I reproduced non-binary, I reproduced binary thinking in my, in, in, in my lecture today and it wasn't possible in the time that I had to do something different. I want to end by showing some examples, which I'm going to show very briefly, but they're joyful books since I've shown you the whole horror cabinet. So there's The Arrival by Sean Tan, which is 2000, from 2007. I love this book. I bought this book immediately. I love this book because there's no word in it aside from the title. So just The Arrival, and then it's wordless. It's a graphic novel that's just wordless. And it's like being in an exhibition, which I go to rarely. It's like surreal paintings. And there's a double page in the beginning that has portraits of people who had to migrate. And uh, it gives face and identity to a whole very diverse group. And then um, there's a double page that shows just all little boxes of clouds. So maybe like, I don't know, 80 different kinds of clouds, <laughs> which doesn't even make any sense, but it's so joyful somehow. So it's a wordless graphic novel, ex with the exception of the title and an artist note at the end. It's from the Australian context. That's where Shonton is born, raised and based. Um, a BPOC, uh, it's a BPOC person. It is a transnational theme and it has surreal paintings. And then um, a book that many of you might know, it's called Mama's Nightingale, a story of immigration and separation by Edward Danticat. Uh, the protagonist is Saya, who's nine years old. Her family migrated to the US from Haiti. Her mother does not have the right papers, so she's held in a detention facility in jail. And Saya's father writes to politicians to get help, but never gets an answer. So Saya writes to a local newspaper, and that sets events in motion with a good ending. I think it's, right now it's good to say that there's a good ending to this. And then the last book is uh, from Austria, and it's by the author Lili Axter and the illustrator Christina A.B. And I love this book because it's about sex education. One of my, 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 my um, uh, focuses is um, what I call a, a sex education empowerment for BIPOC. And it's about sex education. It's not about BIPOC. It's, it's from a white perspective, but it's a very good um, um, a sex education perspective, especially in childhood studies. It's the fourth class in a Volksschule, as it's called in Austria, and it's from the perspective of the girl on the cover. And then it's just the whole peer socialization and, to, and how children try to deal with what sex is, which is hilarious. There's this bear in different, a whole page or double page with a bear in different positions. I, I was laughing, I couldn't stop laughing. So um, that's, these books would definitely be good books to have in a collection. That's my sources, first it's the sources I used, and then uh, sources for further reading. Thank you so much uh, for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the discussion and to, to hearing uh, the different perspectives from the next lectures.